Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Lamia Al Hazani. I'm the head of patient empowerment in the Saudi Patient Safety Center, and I will be serving as a moderator in this webinar. So you will be hearing a presentation from our two speakers, Prof. Wendy Levinson and Dr. Aisha Asagir. They will be speaking to us about choosing wisely, reducing waste with high value care. Dr. Wendy Levinson is a professor of medicine and past chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. She is an expert in the field of physician patient communication, studying topics including the disclosure of medical errors to patients and informed decisions making. She is the chair of Choosing Wisely Canada, a campaign to help physicians and patients engage in conversations about unnecessary tests, treatments, and procedures. She also coordinates Choosing Wisely International, a collaborative of Choosing Wisely campaigns in over 30 countries worldwide. In 2014, Dr. Levinson was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada for her work. And our second speaker, Dr. Aisha Sagir, she is a consultant, family, and home health care physician, leader of Ministry of Health for Choosing Wisely Saudi Arabia, at Ministry of Health adv advisor to Assistant Minister of Health uh, Clinical Associate Professor, Princess University, Bint Abdurrahman University, and head of National Home Health Care Committee, and Saudi Health Council Chairman of Saudi Scientific Home Healthcare Society Board. And now moving along to our session, please welcome Dr. Wendy. The mic is yours, Dr. Wendy. Thank you. Well, good evening, and it's my pleasure to share uh, sort of our journey in Canada on Choosing Wisely with you in the hope that you may learn something from us that you could take forward. Um, so I wanna just begin with, um, a report that we published in April of 2017 um, with our Canadian information system. We took eight of the Choosing Wisely recommendations and we found that up to 30% of all the test treatments and procedures had evidence of overuse or harm to patients. And what is interesting is that this 30% is a number that's been replicated in many countries around the world, even though we organize our healthcare systems so differently. But what this report did is it laid the foundation for us in Canada to take action and showed the medical community there was something we needed to work on. We have followed up with this report in a second one that just came out in April. And I just wanna show you before I get into the details of my talk, that we have made progress. We now have 12 indications, and on eight of eight of these have declined by more than 10% over the last five years. This excludes the COVID time where uh, things really went, and many, many things changed during COVID. Um, and some of these we have not worked on yet, so we're not surprised that they haven't changed. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of room for improvement and to decrease overuse in our healthcare system. And my guess is that you have something similar in yours. Here is an example of one, for example, uh, the use of sedatives in the, in the elderly, where we know they do more harm than good. We used to have one in 10 Canadians on these drugs chronically, and now it's one in 12. So we've made some progress, but we have a lot of work yet to do. So, I mean, people ask, well, why? I mean, it's not intuitive. Why does a doctor or a nurse or nurse practitioner order a test that isn't necessary? And of course, as clinicians, we know there are multiple reasons. Um, a patient wants it. Uh, sometimes a patient will come in, my, my child was up all night with a earache, I need antibiotics. And so the physician wants to meet the patient's expectations. Um, we sometimes order things because we've heard about new tests or treatments, and there's sort of a, a, a push to order newer novel tests, even if they may not or offer more benefit. 
it's easier to give the patient something than to sometimes explain why we're not. So if we're in a hurry, I know it's easier sometimes to give the antibiotic than explain that they're not necessary. Uh, sometimes we get asked to do it by a referring physician, even though it might not be needed. Um, sometimes there are things built into our system that lead us like standing orders in the hospital that routinely say to give a benzodiazepine at night for sleep. And so we don't really order it, it just seems to happen. Um, in North America, um, physicians are very concerned about being sued, and so especially in the United States, and so they may order a test to, quote, leave no stone unturned, be thorough. There are misaligned financial incentives in some systems where doing more means being reimbursed more. Um, but I think the most important is this last bubble I just put up. I've always done this. I learned to do it in my medical training, during medical school, during residency. And once those patterns are established, they're very hard to change. So people have learned ways of ordering tests when someone comes in with a condition. And so I will share with you later that this has been a very important issue for us as we see medical students as a key audience for our work. So the point here is that there are many reasons that we may order things that aren't really necessary or can even harm patients. So the campaign started in the US in 2012, really as part of an effort to pro promote medical professionalism, to get physicians to step forward and say, you know, some of the things we do don't really make sense and we should take leadership in changing that. We started in Canada in April of 2014, so we're coming up on our ninth anniversary. And as you heard, it's now in many countries in the world, and the leaders meet once a year to share learnings with one another. So I'll share with you quite a bit about the Canadian journey. The core principles of the campaign are very important to us. There, this says physician-led. We've ch I would change that word to clinician led because we have other clinicians involved, but we feel that it's important for physicians and clinicians to make the recommendations that underpin this campaign because we know the medical science. It's patient-centered, very focused on conversations between clinicians and patients, multi-professional. I mentioned that we started with medicine, but we have nursing, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, dentists, physical therapist, and a variety of other um, professionals, because I think um, overuse is baked into the entire system and needs to be addressed by all of us. It's strongly evidence-based, and the processes we use to create the recommendations are completely transparent. So these are our core principles, and we ask all countries to use these core principles. Then what we do is ask the societies to um, come up with ideas to, to set up a process that often is a small group that's working together, taking leadership, develop items of potential things in their discipline for which there is excellent scientific evidence of, um, of over overuse or harm to patients. We encourage societies to pick, and these are all national societies, um, lists of items that are frequent, let's, so these are common things like antibiotics, imaging for low back pain, there must be strong scientific evidence, and they have to publish the process they use to develop the list. And we encourage them, by the way, to have patients on their committees as they develop their lists. So this is a typical list of family medicine. Um, I'll pop a few out so that you can see them. By the way, we ask societies to start with five, but over the years, many of them have added, and now we ask them to add a new one every year if they can. So the, here's a family medicine one, don't do imaging for low back pain unless red flags are present. There's always a brief rationale and then the references. Here's another one, don't routinely measure vitamin D in low risk adults. So this is typically what the list look like, but now in Canada, we have almost 500 of them, or probably we're over 500 because we've been at it for a period of time. 
In fact, here is where we are at our um, at the present time. We have about 85 societies, as I mentioned, from all disciplines, almost 500. I think we're over 500 now recommendations. We're a huge country. We are spread out over 3000 miles. And so we have um, a, a hub or a, a choosing wisely center in each of our 13 provinces and territories. Um, we have a wonderful program I'm going to talk about more in a moment where we uh, bring the medical students together to try and change the culture of the medical schools where we often learn these practices. And we have some very important public facing campaigns on public health problems, and I'll share that with you too. So it's a quick overview of our nine year journey. OK, I'm going to share with you a moment about the public education. So this image would probably not work in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> uh, but countries have adapted this early on. Um, we don't use this anymore, but we started a public campaign where we said more is not always better. And as you can see in North America, we go to football, uh, hot, uh, baseball games where we buy hot dogs, and this one has too much mustard. Here's another image of a, a suitcase which is overstuffed. But in, in Denmark uh, or Norway, they use an overflowing glass of milk, and many countries have adapted this because we know that patients in our country, in Canada, often think more is better that when they go to the doctor, they should get tests and treatments, that if they leave without a prescription, they haven't gotten care, and we need to teach them a different message. Often we do this through uh, these posters you see, but really it is also about creating materials that clinicians like doctors can hand out to their patient during a visit to sort of support the messages they're giving. Uh, we have a public education campaign related to antibiotics using use antibiotics wisely. Um, and we, you know, explain in some of our materials that no, we use the words no amount of antibiotics can cure your cold. Um, so that people start to get a different message that more that they don't require antibiotics. And again, these are uh, we have a lot of materials to help physicians and prescribing doctors be able to deliver this message more easily, um, and I can share some of that. We encourage patients to ask four questions, and we embed this in much of our work in different ways. Do I really need this test treatment or procedure? What are the downsides? Are there simpler, safer options? And what happens if I do nothing or if I wait and watch? And I would uh, mention that in the US and some other countries, they use a fifth question, which is how much will this cost? In Canada, in our single payer system, uh, we, we find that not needed. So we, uh, we encourage these kinds of questions. Okay, I'm gonna shift away from the public education campaign. I may come back to a little bit more later, depending on the time, but I'm, I'm gonna say that if the first part of our campaign over the first three years was about raising awareness so that we started to have the message about um, not ordering things that aren't unnecessary, we tried to bring this message forward and raise awareness. The second part of our campaign is really about trying to create tools to help clinicians put this into practice. And so on our website, and you're, you're welcome to use them, they're free, um, we have a lot of tools that have been created in our collective community. Now, these are just a few sample, but they're many, um, you know, and I'm gonna talk about some of them, but why give two when one will do relates to the overuse of red blood cells. Um, and we have a campaign about that. You'll see drop the pre-op about not using, giving unnecessary EKGs, chest x-rays, and lab work on patients who are undergoing very simple low-risk procedures or are themselves in a young age category without risk. Um, there are 
tools related to drugs like bye bye PPI, which stands for proton, proton pump inhibitor, or when psychosis is not the diagnosis, to try and reduce the use of unnecessary antipsychotics. Uh, I'm sure many of these things um, are overused in, in your country too, because we know that uh, they're just frequently overused things. And so we try to create these tools. And in each of the toolkits, we explain that they're overused, what the evidence is for that, um, and what some uh, practical, simple ways are to tackle that problem and to measure the impact in your setting. So if you're launching into some of your work related to implement the Choosing Wisely recommendations, you I think you may find some of this useful. And I'm gonna give you a few examples. So one of the things that happened early in the pandemic is that we had a blood shortage. We were very concerned about our blood shortage. Oops, sorry about that. Because what happened is um, people were not donating blood because as you know, we were not going out of our homes. And so there was a, a marked decrease in donations. There was decrease in use because our surgeries were not being performed. Uh, as much, and there were fewer car accidents, et cetera, but we were concerned about a blood shortage. So we launched this campaign called Using Blood Wisely. In this case, it was focused on hospitals. And again, we knew that um, red blood cells are frequently overused. In fact, the literature showed us approximately 30%, the same number of red blood cell transfusions were not needed. And that if you use more uh, cautious and judicious use of blood, patients did equally well. We also knew from the literature that, um, and from work in Canada in 20 hospitals, that you could do you could do good improvement on this topic. So what you see in this chart is uh, a number of hospitals, and you can see on the top line on the left their use of red blood cells. Um, per patient days. And then pretty simple techniques were used. One, education, which of course is necessary, but never sufficient to change a practice. But they changed the um, orders, their order form, so that um, it indicated appropriate ordering. And when a laboratory technician got an order that didn't meet these criteria, um, they would say, call the nurse or call the doctor and say, we wonder if this is this order might be modified. So the, the criteria we, and, and what you can see is by doing this, they were able to decrease their use of red blood cells by 31%, and that was able to be maintained over time. And what you see on the bottom is also very important, which is they monitored hospital deaths to ensure that there were no sort of adverse consequences from reducing this red blood cell use. And this is not novel, it's been replicated in the literature, but it showed us there was a pretty simple intervention. So we asked the hospitals across Canada to measure themselves by auditing their blood use against two simple criteria that at least that at least 65 percent of their transfusions they only gave one unit remember that toolkit why give two when one will do and we also had a second criteria that was about the hemoglobin level before the transfusion and we set the expectation that at least 80 percent of their transfusions would have a pre-transfusion hemoglobin of 80 grams per liter or less. So these are what we would call restrictive transfusion practices. And we asked them to measure for a period of time of number of months in their hospital. And then um, if they didn't meet these criteria, we had a lot of materials to help them improve. So, what happened is we launched this about two years ago during the pandemic, and you can see that 
um, at present. Over almost 250 hospitals are participating spread out across the country. And this accounts for about 75% of the blood, all the red blood cells transfused in Canada because we've tended to attract more of the big hospitals that transfuse a lot. I mean, we still have room to improve. We don't have all our big hospitals uh, participating and we are trying to get others on board. But you can see that we've had a significant uptake. And if hospitals meet the benchmarks and maintain the benchmarks for um, a period of months, they can be, um, we call them, we designate them a using blood wisely hospital. So we're not paying hospitals to participate, but many of them are participating with, I think, a, a true uh, goal of improvement and seeing that many other people in the country are doing it, and then their hospital gets a recognition statement that they can have um, been awarded by choosing wisely. So I'm sharing with you a way we've tried to create incentives, um, in this case, just a positive encouragement, uh, and do something that is across our whole country. And you you might also think about, as you evolve your campaign, do you want to put attention on one key thing? And I, I think blood is a wonderful one because it's a precious resource donated by society. It ha causes harm to patients because there are transfusion reactions. One in 100 patients has a transfusion overload syndrome. Uh, it's costly. We spend a lot of money purchasing blood. And I would add to that that it has an environmental impact because there's a lot of plastic use and a lot of transportation costs. So I think blood is an example of a win, 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 and, um, and therefore worthy of our attention. I'm going to show you a second one that we've been taking on in a pan-Canadian way, and that is using labs wisely. This is a more recent one for us, but we again know that there's a lot of laboratory testing in the hospital, this is in the hospital, um, where the tests are maybe not needed. And I'm sure that you will recognize these as some of them overused in your setting too. So what we do in this case is we've asked all the hospitals to take five tests or treat, five tests that we think are commonly used. They don't have to limit themselves to these five. They can pick something else that they want to work on. Commit to doing quality improvement in their setting. And commit to being part of a learning collaborative where they really come together and discuss their what they're working on and how they're doing. At the moment, there would be no way in Canada for people to learn how others are doing something like this um, because there, there isn't any common platform for people to share. And what we've asked them to do is take these five that you see on the left, reducing the use of blood urea nitrogen, uh, which often is not necessary compared to having a creatinine level, reducing the use of folate. In Canada, all our food is folate enriched. We really basically don't have folate insufficiency, except extremely rarely. And reducing the use of CKMB because troponin is a more sensitive test and CKMB is outdated. And, uh, in two additional things are often in Canada, People order bundles of tests, like tests for coagulation status. And so we've asked them to reduce their use of PTT compared to PT and INR and reduce their use of AST for liver testing compared to ALT. So in, in our place, in Canada, many hospitals would order an AST, ALT together when really they would do fine just ordering an ALT. So we've tried to what we say unbundle AST and ALT. But other hosp hospitals could take on other priorities. A common one is the use of daily routine labs 
like doing a blood count and chemistry daily, sed rates, uh, vitamin D testing, et cetera. And each could pick their own that they wanted to work on, but they had to submit their data so that we could have comparable data and learn from one another. Um, I, I just want to say one more thing about that. Um, a lot of this quality improvement work on use on any tech project from choosing wisely is local. So when we're bringing some hospitals together, they might be working on other things that are not at all related to blood or labs. And we, of course, want them to feel free to work on anything. But what we've done is also create a program to have hospitals become a Choosing Wisely Canada hospital. And these hospitals, we don't have many of them. We're not trying to have many of them. We want them to be the hospitals that really are putting a lot of effort into the program and have it become embedded in the culture. So we have a recognition program where hospitals can become designated choosing wisely by having to do a certain number of different quality improvement projects where they show us the data that they've made significant improvement. And it could be on the ones I mentioned, but it could be on use of urinary catheters. It could be on um, uh, how they use x-rays. It could be on decreasing the use of unnecessary CT imaging, whatever they want. Um, but if you want the higher level of designation, the leadership status, they have to embed this in the strategic plan of the hospital. And, um, and they have to also mentor another hospital, at least one other hospital. So they have to do more, do it longer, and teach others how to do it. Um, a lot of material, this is, I'm just telling you a little bit about this. It's all on our website, but it has been another way um, of recognizing hospitals. And we think that hospital recognition is helpful for generating interest and enthusiasm about many of these programs. Now, one last thing about this, you will hear that I've talked a lot about hospitals and not as much about other settings like long-term care and primary care. We are starting to work more on both of those, the latter two, long-term care and primary care. It's just that in Canada, we have less good information in those settings. And so it's harder for us to have done them um, to begin with. So we didn't start with them. We started with hospitals where we have better information and better information systems, but we have not forgotten about long-term care and primary care. And those are our future work. Okay, just a couple more things about the public education campaigns. We have um, taken on topics <clears throat> where we really think there's an important public health message. So because we have a lot of opioid problems in Canada and in North America and other countries, as you're aware, we tried to take our messaging and apply it to other situations. This is a complex problem. Opioids are extremely complicated, as you know. And so we did not do this campaign alone, but with partners, we tried to contribute some of our messaging, some of our imagery um, to their effort, to these efforts. We also have a campaign, and again, you can see details on our website called Time to Talk. Um, in Canada, many, many people die in the hospital when it would not have been their wish to do so. In fact, uh, we feel that uh, many patients in Canada get overtreated at the end of life. If they had had an opportunity to tell their loved ones that they what they do want and what they don't want, that decisions might have been different. And so we have a campaign called Time to Talk to encourage clinicians and patients to have conversations about what people would want should their condition become uh, uh, more serious if they would want cardiac resuscitation, et cetera. We use this a lot during the COVID campaign, COVID period, because uh, 
many primary care doctors were reaching out to their patients, their elderly patients, to have these kinds of conversations. So there is a lot of material that's public facing and a lot of patient pamphlets on our website that may be useful useful to you, and we are you're free to use them. Okay, I'm going to shift and talk about our student program. So we have a medical student program that was started and created by medical students. There were summer students that worked with us in the summer, and they came up with the term Choosing Wisely STARS, which stands for Students and Trainees Advocating for Resource Stewardship. Resource stewardship is a word that we have embedded in a lot of our medical education materials. And in fact, our um, accreditor for medical education, the Royal College of um, Physicians and Surgeons for our residency, has now created, a, they have competencies, as those in medical education know, and you have to demonstrate competency in resource stewardship. So these students created a campaign to try and, what I say is teach up, because in Canada, it's very difficult to change a medical school curriculum. We have 17 medical schools. And everybody wants to get something into the curriculum. And if you work from the top down through the medical, um, the dean's offices, it takes forever. So we thought, okay, let's work with the students and teach up. And we invited two medical students from each of the schools in Canada to come to a training program they have their fingers up in C's and W's, to learn about the campaign and about the overuse of medical tests and treatments. But more importantly, to go back to their medical school and try to embed the messages about overuse and choosing wisely in the medical school curriculum. And they were just fantastic. They did all kinds of creative things. And we have done this now, first at our national meetings, but then because of the pandemic, that became virtual. So you're seeing a virtual picture here, a picture of our virtual meetings. And we've now done this for about uh, eight years. And so we have, a, and that means 34 students a year. We have a very growing cadre of several hundred medical students who have um, continued to work on creative ways to embed this in their medical school curriculum. And so what kinds of things have they done? They've created interest groups. They've gone into the curriculum like uh, many of our medical schools have problem cases that students use to learn. They've tried to embed the messages about choosing wisely in the cases. They've done needs assessments or uh, campaign weeks, or three medical schools have run big conferences where they invite speakers. They've done all kinds of things to encourage um, getting this embedded. And we would never have come up with these ideas. And of course, we could never have done them centrally. Um, they needed to do them in their own way and see where the what they could do. We have linked them to faculty so that they get some faculty support because we know the faculty who are interested. And we require that they are meet with the Dean's office uh, when they come back from these meetings. So there is some connection to their deans. But basically this program has taken off in Canada. And in fact, a very sweet story is that one of the three medical students that started the campaign is now himself on faculty and he runs the campaign. So this is really um, a, a really nice symbol that it can grow through medical education. And we think this has been uh, highly successful in terms of changing students' awareness of the problem. And in fact, the STARS program now is in about six or seven countries in the world and if this is something you are interested in, I can send you literature and have you meet with the leaders of the STARS program. So um, in the time I have left before questions, I wanna just say a little bit about the international work. So, you know, it is quite remarkable because if you think about, 
how different our countries are and how we organize our healthcare systems, you would think, well, surely this would not become international uh, because, you know, the United States healthcare system is extremely different than that in uh, many other countries in the world. And yet something that started in the U.S. has spread all over to most of the, the Scandinavian countries, the European countries, um, to uh, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. And what I want to also mention is although it mainly started in wealthy countries, the more developed countries, it is now increasingly in low and middle income countries. And there is a robust program in Brazil, in Colombia, uh, Argentina is beginning, Peru. Uh, there's a program in India focused on uh, oncology and a pro program in Rwanda and Sub-Saharan Africa focused also on oncology and mounted on India's. So I, I just think it's worth reflecting. Um, that's very interesting that we uh, have something that has spread so much across multiple countries and just by word of mouth. I mean, no one was out promoting it. Um, I'm giving you a talk because I was, you know, we have some experience we can share, but no one has been trying to spread this. It really has spread by word of mouth. And I think it's because it just makes sense in many of our healthcare systems. So we meet on a regular basis once a year. Uh, the Canadian team organizes this, was our last meeting in Lisbon, really to try to share ideas and um, be able to not learn from one another. Um, we've worked with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which uh, really shares learning across the OECD countries. Once a year, the ministers of health from these countries meet. And in this particular year of 2017, they published this report called Tackling Wasteful Spending in Health. And every year, the OECD publishes uh, a report called Health at a Glance. And Health at a Glance compares um, countries to one another on certain common topics. So because of choosing wisely and our relationship with the OECD leader uh, who developed this health at a glance, you will see a few examples here of how countries compare to each other. Now, I don't, I don't have the data for Saudi Arabia, I apologize for that, but you can see that this antibiotics prescribed has enormous variation across different countries because this is doses per thousand population per day. And you can see that in some countries like Sweden, there are, this is on the low side. Canada does not do as well as Sweden or many countries. We're at about the uh, average for the OECD. But then other countries like France and Iceland, Australia and Greece have extremely high rates of antibiotic prescribing. And of course, we all know that this is an impending public health concern because we have antibiotic resistance, uh, which I think we haven't paid as much attention to because we got distracted by COVID, but we are all going to be experiencing problems with this. And this allows us to compare ourselves one with one another. And I think these comparisons at all levels, at the hospital level, at individual physician level, Wherever you can give people data about how they do compared to others, it's very helpful for driving quality improvement. So that was the purpose of these kinds of reports. Here's another one that I find very interesting to me, which is the use of chronic benzodiazepines and other sedatives, which really are not indicated in people over 65, except uh, in, infrequently because they lead to falls, memory loss, uh, motor vehicle accidents, fractures. So uh, they're really drugs that should be avoided. And you can see the enormous variation again between countries like Canada that still we still have work to do. And I mentioned that to you earlier. 
whereas uh, some countries like Portugal, Iceland, and, um, and Ireland have very, very high rates of use. And I think it does allow them to start to say, what are other countries in the world doing? How can we modify our practices? So just a, a, a few comments um, before I bring this to the end and open it for questions. I do think that we started the campaign um, very much focused on the relationship between the patient and the clinician, first physicians, but then more broadly nurses, nurse practitioners. But we all work in a system and that system can either uh, decrease overuse, help us to decrease overuse, or it can create barriers to decreasing overuse. You know, for example, I mentioned in a hospital system, some things just get put into order sets and they happen almost automatically. Any patient admitted for surgery gets an EKG chest X-ray and, um, and uh, lab work whether they really it's indicated for them or not. Um, and there are systems barriers even in our country at the government level. So for example, we had a situation where orthopedic surgeons were required to send any tissue they removed to pathology. So when they did hip and knee replacements, which are extremely common, they removed some tissue that was not clearly not malignant or anything worrisome is just routine tissue that they need to resect to do the um, to do the 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 hip or knee replacement. They were required by law to send this for uh, tissue analysis. And yet our pathologists are overwhelmed in our system. And so we were able to work with our government to change the rules so that surgeons were no longer required to send tissue from hip and knees to pathology. So that's an example. It's a simple one, but it's a systems barrier that was making overuse just have to happen. And so as you develop your campaign, thinking about where are those systems barriers that might be uh, leading to overuse or getting the way of reducing overuse, and, and you might tackle them too. But I think the beginning is clearly the clinician and the patient. Lastly, I'm going to bring up something I alluded to just briefly in, in my presentation, which is that uh, health care is a major contributor to carbon emissions. Across the world, it's considered that carbon emissions from the healthcare system account for 5% of global carbon emissions. That, by the way, is more than the airline industry, which is 3.5%. So here we are, health professionals who have um, a commitment to the health of our patients and our populations, and at the same time, our own health systems are contributing to a climate crisis that is, uh, it, it has impending uh, major problems, and I could give a whole separate talk about this. But really what I'm suggesting here is that we also can think about decreasing overuse being the right thing for patients because these tests can be, or treatments can be harmful and lead to more unnecessary testing. They can, they're harmful to our healthcare systems because they're costly. Um, we should be investing our resources in any country in high value care and eliminating low value care. So it's both can be harmful to patients, harmful to our healthcare systems, which we need to sustain and deliver high quality. And I would add a third major reason now, which is, and they can be harmful for our environment. So just for a, one example, in the in anesthesia, uh, uh, there are very volatile gases that are frequently used for anesthesia and can be substituted with equally effective anesthesia drugs that have much less carbon footprint. And so I think we can 
look for opportunities to decrease harmful things for patients, harm to our healthcare system, and harm to our environment, all by reducing unnecessary care. So um, I think in conclusion, I would say choosing wisely has resonated in many countries, despite our very different healthcare systems, as a way to address a common problem of overuse. I think our first phase was to engage physicians, then we broadened that um, much more to the multiple health professionals. Um, engaging patients is key. I haven't talked about that as much. We believe medical education is vital because this is where we shape our lifelong practices. And I would say it really is about a culture. We have built a culture of overuse over many, many years. It won't change overnight. Uh, I think we in Canada have learned we need to be patient. It's a journey that will take a lot of time, but we are seeing the fruits of that labor and can, uh, you know, I think over time, see it grow and flourish and um, deepen in the settings that we work in, like long-term care and primary care, and hopefully uh, contribute to the health of, uh, of patients, our health system, and the environment. So I will stop there. I look forward to your questions. I'll take my slides down. Um, and, um, oops, we'll just go back Thank to this. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you okay. very much for this amazing presentation. It was very informative and very clear and very interesting. So we have a couple of questions, actually. Uh, one of them is, uh, from Faisal, our attendee, he's saying, what do you think about some critics argue that there is not enough evidence to show that the Choosing Wisely campaign has actually led to reduction in necessary medical procedure, while the campaign has been successful in raising awareness about the issue? There is still a need for more data to show its impact or not? So I'm, I'm really glad that you asked this question. I think about it all the time. Um, you know, I think you're right. There have been people who have criticized choosing wisely as not making a difference. Um, what what they say is might be. And of course, some of those studies have shown that if you publish that the only thing that happened was the lists were published. Now, if it was so easy to change behavior as publishing a list, we would not have a problem in medicine. <laughs> but we know that education alone does not change behavior. It is difficult to change behavior. And the research shows that you have to use multiple interventions to change behavior. Education, yes, but also audit and feedback, changing order sets, giving reminders. It, all kinds of interventions are needed. And I think the campaign is not, there, there hasn't been enough years for many of these to mature and be in the literature, but it is happening. There's, there's a growing body of literature now on interventions to, to um, decrease utilization. And I think the problem with a lot of it has been, and maybe you, your country can help with this, is that much of it is done on a local level, like in one hospital, and it's not done by researchers. It's done by people like you and me, who are just trying to change our hospital. And so it doesn't get published. So I agree with you. We do need to show more change, but I just showed you the Canadian data from our full Canadian information system. And eight of 12 indicators of overuse have fell over five years. Yes. Now that may not be just choosing wisely because that wasn't a randomized trial but it does show progress and we will publish our blood use and our laboratory use uh, laboratory tests soon. And these, and, and, and I think we will also show that you can create behavior change, but I, I think you're asking the right question. We need more rigorous trials. They need to be designed in a rigorous enough way and published. And um, that is going to take time, but it's happening. It's just, no one would expect, I want to underscore, no one would expect in any area 
that just publishing recommendations would lead to changes in behavior. It is not that simple. Yes, exactly. But I would like to elaborate more. Uh, even if um, if the impact is not showing on real life, but studies are showing, as you said, here even in Saudi Arabia, studies are showing that there is a decrease of unnecessary waste uh, um, uh, in, in different uh, areas. So I just wanted to uh, uh, reinforce this uh, point. Another question from this the same um, attendee saying, what do you think of the argument that uh, the campaign does not emphasize the importance of individualized uh, care and shared decision making between patients and their healthcare providers, especially there is a lack of understanding of power and knowledge dynamic between medical professionals and the patients. For example, people with disability and Aboriginal people in Canada. Okay, so first of all, I would say that the absolute core of choosing wisely is conversations between clinicians and patients helping individual patients make the right choices. These recommendations are not never do it, never order imaging for low back pain. You work with your, we work with our patient and we figure out whether it's needed for them. And in fact, sometimes I order an unnecessary test. You know, if a, a patient of mine has headaches and they're so worried that they have a brain tumor that they won't I don't think it's likely, but they feel they will not rest unless they have a CT scan. I might order a CT scan, even though I don't think it's needed. It is all about conversations and shared decision making. That is the basis of choosing wisely. Now, the issue about subpopulations like our, our indigenous population in Canada, in New Zealand, the Maori population, these are very important questions. I think increasingly we're trying to listen and understand how overuse is seen by our indigenous population. Are we where we would like to be in that journey? No, we are starting in that journey and trying to uh, listen and understand. Some countries have done more than we have, like New Zealand, that very much worked with their um, Maori population on choosing wisely. So um, we hope to do better on that in Canada and we try to learn from other countries. Thank you, Dr. There is uh, one last question. Uh, grammarly, it's not very clear, but uh, I will try to explain it. So uh, Dr. Hannan is asking, uh, is there uh, uh, a guideline or a recommendation for a, uh, the use of narcotic after operation? Yes, I mean, every country has their own recommendations. Um, so, but I know in the Canadian one, there are recommendations about not sending people home with too large a quantity of narcotics um, post-op. One of the things that happens in Canada is frequently people go home with a very large jar <laughs> of uh, an opioid when they could be using a non um, uh, a non-narcotic product. And so there, I think there are quite a few and in fact, you know, if I would recommend you look at our opioid wisely campaign, because in the opioid wisely, we have all the recommendations that pertain to that, including the surgical ones that might be useful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Wendy. I would like to invite Dr. Aisha if she has any question or any comments that we, she would like to share with you and um, on uh, to to for our audience to hear and uh, learn from. Dr. Aisha, if you can unmute, please. Yeah, yes, uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Lamia. Uh, thank you, Prof. It was really very amazing and informative and uh, very clear about choosing wisely Canada. Uh, and uh, as we are now, we've, uh, we've started and we are now in the second year, uh, the big question that we are having and asked for, can we evaluate the campaign and the nationwide? And what are the metric issues that we could have to measure uh, the things going on, on uh, while we are implementing uh, this over the country. Do you have a similar thing, which is? Yeah. Um, so first, I think it is very important that one of the metrics is awareness, because if you, you can't make major change if you don't start from the beginning. So I think having a meeting like you're having you could measure physicians' awareness of overuse in their practice 
by surveys because you, you won't get to, I mentioned this is really a journey. And if the people who are running your program think that by tomorrow you should show all these um, behaviors have changed, um, I would encourage them to think of, are there any other places that's happened? <laughs> because usually there are not places that happens. I mean, we, this takes time. But one of the reasons we started the blood program is we thought it was a place that we could make a difference in a shorter period of time and be able to measure it. So I would first encourage you to tell everyone, this is not a short journey. This is awareness building and then lots of local grassroots efforts and that behavior change does not happen overnight. I mean, the only behavior change that can happen overnight is if the government payer says we will not be paying for vitamin D levels. You can change something like that overnight by a payment reform. But so many things in medicine don't lend themselves to a payment reform because they're nuanced. They're about imaging for low back pain if red flags are present. The antibiotics are indicated in some circumstances. It's not just they're never indicated. So I think you have to be very clear on to everyone who asks, show me what you're doing, that this is a process, that it takes time, that these this is a culture, and at first you need to raise awareness. And then secondly, my advice to you is to pick something whether it's uh, preoperative testing in low-risk patients that might be e something that in your setting might be feasible to work on with a simple intervention and simple to measure. I, I don't know, you know, that is system dependent. So that you could earlier start to get some data on behavior change. But I would not get people's expectations up that you will turn this around overnight. We didn't get into this problem overnight and we won't get out of it overnight. Yes, sure. And I, I liked so much that the rewards, which you said that it's a part of uh, the accreditation, which you did. Uh, and do you believe that this a real thing that has, did that change for Canada choosing wisely? That when you have the accreditation and the reward as a reward? Yes, I think our hospitals, like getting recognized as being excellent. Yes. I think all of us like to be rewarded yeah. as being excellent. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's part of our professionalism that we mm -hmm. want to be good. And that's why mm -hmm. audit and feedback also work so well. And I would encourage you to look for opportunities for audit and feedback, because mm -hmm. if we can compare ourselves to peers, we often think we are performing well. Um, mm -hmm. And then we see data comparing us on some measure to another, like maybe I order twice as many x-rays for low back pain as my colleague. And I go, wow, I thought I was doing this well, but obviously someone is doing it better than me. Any opportunities you can have in your program to give feedback to a person, an individual clinician, to a hospital, and compare it to their peers, it's powerful motivation. Very powerful motivation. Uh, and if you could, yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is right, absolutely. Uh, and also, if you could share with us the student uh, stars, which you if you just mentioned that the stars program, because uh, did you apply it in home in all the universities or in some some kinds of? Uh, I like this part about the stars. We, we have 17 medical schools in Canada, and we included all of them and invited two students every year um, wow. to participate in the program. Mm. Okay, great. If you could share with us the, about I'm this program. I'm happy to. I'll, I'll send yeah. it, you information about that. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very mm. much, Dr. Awandi. We we are really glad that uh, you joined this webinar and uh, hope our audience have benefited from your presentation. Uh, it's been an honor uh, uh, having you here. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, and um, good good luck with your your choosing wisely campaign. I I hope uh, to hear about your progress over time. All I'm all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. We Bye -bye. hope that too. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, now moving on to our next uh, presentation uh, with Dr. Aisha Asagir. She's a consultant, family and home health care physician, a leader of Ministry Health post COVID-19 project. Uh, choosing wisely uh, um, a champion at the Ministry of Health, advisor to Assistant Minister of Health, a clinical associate professor in, at Princess Noura University, uh, and head of National Home Health Care Committee, Saudi Health Council, and the chairman of Saudi Scientific Home Health Care Society Board. Uh, welcome, Dr. Aisha. We would like you to share uh, your presentation. Uh. Thank you so much. Take your time. And yeah, I would share it now. Thank you so much. Thanks for presenting me and I would. I would like to remind everyone that we will read the questions from uh, the Q&A box. You will find it uh, on the um, on the uh, uh, box above. OK, did you the mic see is my your screen? Computer. Yes. Is the screen clear? Yeah. OK. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thanks, Chairman uh, uh, Lamia, for introducing me. It was uh, interesting. The previous uh, Dr. Prof. Wendy, she make my life easy. And uh, just I will cover the, the Saudi part of choosing wisely. Uh, and uh, as it was very clear, that uh, so choosing wisely can make a difference in our practice. Uh, to just to start with, to disclose uh, nothing to disclose in respect to this presentation. Uh, during my talk, I will recognize the harm associated with overuse, define the choosing wisely the campaign, areas of overuse, uh, Saudi Arabia choosing wisely, and one of the success stories that we have. Uh, and the opportunities for improvement and what we think are the next step in regard to choosing wisely Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, as uh, all of you know, as a clinician in our practice, we face few cases daily. Uh, Prof. Wendy, she raised this and now I will give two scenarios about this. This is a 27-year-old female. She has a frequent headache for the past week. Uh, her history is remarkable for migraine. Uh, she had it uh, one to two uh, per year. A neurological examination is within normal, but she insisted to have, and she thought that she has a brain tumor, and she insists to have a CT scan. Uh, this is an emergency department in which we have a 35-year-old male, uh, frequent low back pain for the past week. History is remarkable for muscular pain. Neurological examination is normal. Uh, and uh, he is over thinking about the MS, uh, multiple sclerosis, as his friend ha has just recently been diagnosed and insisted to have MRI. Uh, these are two scenarios that we see in the practice. Do we need to expose the patient to radiation? Is there a harm of radiation? Do we need to do this? Do we need to apply for the patient? Uh, concern. Uh, it is very clear for us that the radiation exposure uh, it differ according to an MRI is safe. It has zero radiation exposure, as it's clear here. But if you go at other chest X-ray or X-rays, just X-rays, uh, is also there is radiation exposure. While if you go to CT scan, either lumbar or abdomen, you go to a higher radiation exposure uh, for the patient. Is this safe? Uh, on the other hand, for MRI, MRI it has no radiation, but uh, this patient, she has, uh, she's 29 years old, she has this MRI done, and it showed that she has herniation disc. Uh, patient, she wants and selected to have a conservative treatment, and six months later, the, the thing was resolved spontaneously. Uh, so uh, she has this MRI done six uh, six months later. Nothing is there; and it's normal. Uh, uh, so she was labeled to have an issue. Uh, is there harm of labeling the patient? Those who receive results uh, with unnecessarily 
uh, investigation or unnecessary procedure done, uh, they have a smaller improvement in general. Uh, in the other hand, uh, they, this increase the focus of a minor issue and avoid them to have a normal life. Uh, and it could relate to increase in the anxiety. Uh, and on the other hand, when we overdiagnose the patient, we have what's known as incident traumas. We incidentally, we find something. Uh, finding that unrelated to the clinical indication. And this will lead us to do another examination or another intervention to confirm, which is another thing which is unnecessarily, and we see this commonly in the practice. Uh, for this incident, trauma uh, leads us to do more harm to the patient uh, and no improvement in the plan. Uh, this is a format, what do we mean? Victim of the modern imaging technology. Offer diagnosis, offer use, so the patient is a victim of this. Uh, this has been published in the British Medical Journal. Uh, it showed that uh, there, these patient exposure to this uh, imaging, it will offer the time, uh, it needs them to have a harm, and it could be a, car a carcinogenic. Uh, are we willing in the practice to address this, this problem? Uh, is it a responsibility of the people who are working on the field? Uh, this is a physician charter. It showed that it's not only the, uh, that we are meeting the needs of individual patient only, but also physicians are responsible to do appropriate allocation of the resources. We are all the time, we have limited resources. Allocating this limited uh, resources is one of the mandate for the physicians and the practitioner who are in the field. Uh, also, avoiding the harm. It's not only providing the care, but also avoiding uh, uh, harm that we could expose the patient by uh, offer diagnosis uh, or using something which is uh, irrelevant. So, if we go dive more over the inside the hospital, there is, a, uh, it's just what we are seeing at the tip of the iceberg. And actually, uh, a lot is there inside if we dive and go inside the, 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 the tools that is used uh, the patient. And now the new word that you hear commonly is the value of care. What is the value of care? Uh, basically, we provide the best care for the patient. Uh, and uh, if we want to, to do it in an equation, the value of care is a quality over the cost. If you improve the quality of the surface, you provide a uh, safe, um, time, timely, efficient, effectiveness, patient center, and equitable care. This will improve the quality. And if you could reduce the host, uh, the cost of the surface, uh, either directly or indirectly, you you could have an improvement in the value. Uh, how choosing wisely can help is choosing wisely is part of this to improve the faculty of care. And it was very clear that choosing wisely, as Dr. Brof Wendy said earlier, uh, it is an international initiative. It's aimed to, provo to uh, promote a conversation between clinicians and patients to choose the appropriate care. Uh, it, it looks for one of the prime goals for choosing wisely to improve the health outcome, avoid the unnecessarily and could be harmful intervention, in the same time to reduce the cost, and this will help in improving the value of care. It encourages the conversation between the healthcare professionals and patient. This should be done by the best available evidence and under recommendation. Uh, and do not undergo unnecessarily test or, or procedure that could harm the patient. Definitely choosing wisely has these challenges. More is not always better. This is the Arabic or the Saudi part of this. Uh, and we don't always uh, mean, uh, it, it, uh, we can, does not always mean we should. I can prescribe antibiotic, but do I, uh, I have to do it or not? I can uh, do a requested an x-ray or CT for the patient. Uh, I can request the labs, but it's not always that I should do it. And this needs to be kept in our mind while we are dealing with the patient. 
Definitely choosing YC started in the United States 200, uh, 2012. It was spread, as you said, in Canada, Australia, Brazil, uh, Japan. Now, as it was very clear, uh, more 30 countries uh, has been uh, there, and Saudi choosing YC has started in 2019. Uh, definitely, the main concept of choosing wisely, it should be according to the evidence. It starts from recommendations, uh, and these recommendations should be listed from the scientific society, and it is um, it is based on an evaluated uh, by commonly choosing test or a treatment uh, believed to be offer used or misused or harmful in the society and in Saudi Arabia. We are different than others, so this should be done. In the United States, Canada, Australia, all other countries, they have the list, which is coming from uh, a recommendation coming from the society there. Uh, as I'm a family physician, uh, this is one of the lists that has been done in uh, the United States, the 15 things physician and patient should question, and they list it. At the same time, they challenge the five questions, uh, and this is one of the concepts that the uh, the patient should ask the physician whenever he uh, get uh, for any test treatment uh, prescribed or procedure ordered. Uh, and these five questions is essential and one of the main concepts for the conversation shooting wisely. Now, why now? Why we want to have a choosing wisely now? Why we are uh, raising this now in Saudi Arabia? We did a survey, uh, and this survey was to know the current situation in our healthcare system. This was done by Ministry of Health, uh, and uh, it was spread the monkey survey about the uh, the hospitals and the physicians who are on field. We received more than uh, 600 replies from the physician. It was very clear from their reply uh, that uh, more than 80% never heard for choosing wisely. Uh, near half of them, they feel they are not responsible or uncomfortable to talk to, to the patient about the unnecessary test or procedure. And about more than a quarter of them, they consider unnecessarily tests and procedure uh, as not a problem at all. From there, uh, this has very clear for us. We are part of the world. And in this survey, the most common offer used in physician practice uh, based on choosing wisely target area recommendation, prescribing antibiotic to come, uh, come in the top of the list. Uh, it's uh, more than 50% of the replies that they could prescribe unnecessary antibiotic. Uh, another thing is about uh, the diagnostic labs in the ICU and pre-op. Uh, they, in about 50%, it is unnecessarily ordered uh, for the patient. Uh, for the radiation exposure, the, the CT scan and the X-ray, uh, also it is commonly um, uh, ordered for the patient, which is not necessarily in 50% of the physician who replied for the survey. Uh, when we ask them about the reason for ordering unnecessarily test, it was about half of the uh, of the answers that the patient requests. They want to keep the patient satisfied, uh, and they feel this is uh, good for them. Another uh, quarter, they the physicians want to be uh, feel safe, and uh, it is not a mistake. I don't want to miss, and that's why I'm requesting. Uh, sometimes the hospital uh, uh, guidelines, it is uh, requesting me to do something which is unnecessarily, and this is a quarter of the physicians, they reply by this answer. Uh, so, uh, these, are, these are the priority outcome or list that we could have. And from there, we started the Choosing Wisely campaign. It is an initiative. Uh, launched initially by the Ministry of Health, and now it's a collaboration between Saudi Patients, uh, uh, Patient Safety Center and Ada Health uh, in implementing uh, the, the, the campaign. Uh, it definitely improved the uh, focus on improving the quality and safety of the patient to reduce the waste and non-value uh, care that could be done, and it is uh, depending on the best practices and guidelines in the commonly prescribed pharmacological or requested radiological or lab tests. 
the key things and key, key activities that should be done by the uh, when we implement the choosing wisely is to start with assessment. Wherever any institute want to adapt the choosing wisely, they need to know the gap. Where is the gap? What is the priority area? And they need to define the waste unnecessary procedure that's commonly used. Uh, then they need to have and adapt the recommendation that uh, provide and approved uh, that the, it's uh, an evidence base, so they implement this recommendation in avoiding this unnecessary pre procedure. Uh, training and training and training and awareness inside the institute is one of the corner steps when implementing choosing wisely. Uh, and uh, this will help a lot that the process should be continuous uh, to engage everyone, all the stakeholders uh, in the institute, and uh, a good awareness is essential. And then we monitor what we are doing uh, to have the success story and proof that uh, the, what we are doing is right and to what direction we are going. And a sustainability plan should be there. Uh, so we make sure that what we are applying will be uh, continuous. Right now, uh, we have uh, we received uh, a uh, list of recommendation from the Saudi Scientific Society, uh, from the Saudi Society of Emergency Medicine, Saudi Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, the Saudi Society of Clinical Pharmacy, Saudi Society of Family and Community Medicine, and we are also receiving another uh, maybe seven or uh, eight uh, societies are sending for us and we are it's under review by the, by the scientific uh, team of uh, Saudi Choosing Wisely and all of this uh, is uploaded in the website of Saudi Choosing Wisely. Usually whatever recommendation we will have it will be an evidence base it is prioritized according to the uh, to Saudi Arabia uh, overuse uh, and the areas of overuse in Saudi Arabia. It is written in this way uh, with a clear uh, tool uh, to, for measuring the impact when we implement uh, choosing wisely and an educational material uh, that is in Arabic for uh, spreading this to the patient because to encourage the conversation uh, and to make sure that they, the, uh, the patient is aware of the recommendation and uh, the evidence behind it. Uh, this is the template which we use for all the recommendations, Saudi choosing wisely recommendation. It is, uh, it is, uh, uh, we receive it from the scientific society, reviewed from the uh, scientific society in Saudi choosing wisely, and then uh, it will be uploaded. Uh, right now we have uh, 20 champions all over the kingdom, choosing wisely a program initiative focus on both patient and physician and will be implemented all over the kingdom uh, in all regions or institute. Uh, just, uh, and I want to, uh, I'm so happy and glad uh, um, I was uh, participating in one of the success stories that has been implemented in uh, King Khalid General Hospital in Hafer Baltan. Uh, and uh, at that time, with the team, we measure the effect of choosing wisely campaign uh, in Hafer al um, And this uh, implementation that we adopted the three uh, choosing wisely recommendation, uh, not to test for uh, CKMB in the diagnosis of acute uh, uh, MI, uh, myocardial infarction, avoid the brain CT scan in emergency department with minor head injuries who are at low risk uh, and not to prescribe antibiotic routinely for acute mild to moderate sinusitis. Uh, and before we uh, this will be expanded, uh, it was uh, uh, we assist and identify whether it was cost effective or not. Um, and this was the aim of the study to know the prevalence of using of these tools uh, before and after implementing the choosing wisely, uh, uh, the choosing wisely campaign. Uh, it was uh, done in the emergency department. It was implemented at the period uh, uh, October 2019 to January 2020. The COVID time was a barrier at that time, and uh, we, we uh, that time we stopped because of the COVID. Uh, actually, the methodology used that uh, we started with initial awareness um, for all the stakeholders. Uh, recommendation was selected. 
uh, and uh, it was the staff and the patient education was there. Extensive awareness education for all the hospital, uh, engaging everyone who is in, uh, will help in the shared decision of the patient, and we adapt the recommendation. Uh, this uh, cycle of uh, education promotion, having a partner with the scientific society and measuring uh, and reporting was the circle behind implementing this. Uh, we measure the total number of patients who have been encountered to uh, the emergency department. Uh, and uh, we also collected the total number of patients who received the CKMB. Uh, and it was uh, performed for them and uh, uh, the number of patients who have a normal result also for the CT scan, the same thing, all the patient who has a request or order of CT scan and uh, the result was normal uh, and number of uh, patients who encountered uh, or prescribed the amoxicillin. Uh, then we, we had a clear outcome to have the proportion of the encounters where the CKMB was performed or, uh, with abnormal finding to know the difference, the diagnostic yield for both the CT and CKMB and the patient who had a prescription and, and the difference before and after uh, having the choosing wisely. Uh, at that time, uh, the choosing wisely form was distributed to everyone. Uh, a lot of awareness has been done uh, and distributed to the patient. Uh, uh, all the stakeholders, including the, uh, everyone who's in the hospital, the lead of the, the director of the hospital, the departments in all the three departments, the emergency, the pharmacy, the lab, and the radiology were involved. The staff who is working there, uh, all of them were part of the choosing wisely. An app has been uh, implemented so the patient will have an awareness about this. These are the results, pre-intervention and post-intervention for the CKMB, the proportion of patients who encountered uh, uh, the use of unnecessarily tests before and after. It was a very short period, as, we, as I said, it was, uh, yani the comparison was for one month and we, we started because of the COVID. Like, it was a significant difference, very clear. When we implement, there is a, a decrease in uh, prescribing the CKMB, which is not needed. The same thing is for the brain CT scan, uh, pre and post uh, intervention. Then uh, the, there is a significant reduction. Uh, and uh, the proportion for the patient who encountered with abnormal CT scan was higher uh, after the intervention, so the patient necessarily uh, need the CT and it was requested for them uh, when it was prescripted uh, uh, and also for the antibiotic prescription, there is a significant reduction in prescribing the antibiotic in the hospital. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very clear that there, there was a significant reduction in the use of uh, CKMB and brain CT in the emergency department uh, and there is improvement in the diagnostic yield and there was a significant reduction in the use of uh, uh, antibiotic in the emergency department and based on this data we recommend to continue choosing wisely and it's implemented. This is one of the, this is a published paper that, by the way, uh, and uh, this was just to uh, to confirm uh, the small impact in one of the institutes of choosing wisely. Uh, next step, what are the next step? We would like to continue creating an awareness for both patient and physician, uh, provide support to the region champion, measure the impact. Uh, before and after and we would like it to be published and we want to distribute the success story as was done in Hafer Bottom before. Uh, to take home message, it is very clear that choosing wisely is a national transformation in the healthcare sector uh, to limit unnecessarily test and procedure. Uh, five things we need to know, don't order investigation that will not change management plan. Don't repeat a laboratory investigation on a clinically stable patient. Don't, don't use IV when, when oral uh, option is there. And don't do an urgent investigation or procedure that will delay discharge for the patient from the hospital. 
don't do an invasive study uh, if less invasive uh, are available and uh, as effective. These are main concepts in general. If we go d and dig more uh, about the recommendation in each specialty, we have it in a different way. Don't provide care, which evidence show is not effective. A decision are made collaboratively with the patient, and that's why awareness is there. Uh, we need to give each patient the care that they need, but also we need to consider what they don't need and avoid care that can cause harm for the patient. It's really time to change. And uh, I'm encouraging all of you to be part of uh, Saudi Cheesing Wisely if you are ready to change. Uh, we have our website. If you could uh, uh, scan the, the code or we can send you the link for... Uh, uh, choosing wisely uh, a Twitter account and uh, website so you can follow all the updates in regarding to Saudi choosing wisely. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Aisha. It was a very amazing presentation. And as you can see, a lot of uh, reactions from our audience um, uh, very happy with this impact and this study. And we would like also to announce that there are other studies that would, uh, have been published in regarding to choosing wisely. Um, uh, I would like to read some comments and some questions um, from our audience. Sure. So uh, one of our uh, attendees, our, our audience, have uh, commented, um, uh, I believe this campaign is very timely. And as part of the multidisciplinary team, I hope this will be a strengthened among healthcare institutions in the kingdom. Thank you for this information. After all, our main goal is quality and patient safety. So, so this is just a comment from our audience. I, I just wanted to share. Um, uh, to, uh, to everyone. And then she asked a question while you are talking about the success story. She's saying uh, implementation of order set or the clinical pathways does not help in reducing or st strengthening this campaign. I'm not sure uh, if the question is clear or not. Uh, sorry, if you can repeat it here. Let me, I yeah, did, of course. I yeah. yeah, if not, we can ask her to uh, repeat the question in a, a more uh, clear mm -hmm. way. She's saying implementation of order set or the clinical pathways does not help in reducing or st strengthening this campaign. She was asking while you are presenting one of the slides. Um, what I yani, got from this question that in applying the evidence-based recommendation will help to reduce it unnecessarily. إذا كان فهمي صح I understand well uh, yes if we could uh, يعني apply this is يعني concept all the concept about choosing wisely you do something which is evidence based so this will help you to avoid unnecessarily when I request an x-ray for the patient the patient should should have red flags that let me requested this. Uh, I ordered uh, a uh, TSH for the patient and this uh, I ordered this t TSH for the patient because this is uh, he has the symptoms and by evidence in this stage he needs the, the TSH. Uh, and I prescribed an uh, antibiotic for the patient because this patient is having a bacterial infection and this is by this is supportable from his clinical picture by an evidence and recommendation. Uh, if we could go with the, the recommendation, this will help in avoiding unnecessarily test and procedure. Uh, if I get the question uh, yes. right. Hope so. So we ask her if, if the, uh, the, the answer is not um, clear enough, you can repeat the question. Another uh, question uh, from our audience, what do you think of the argument that's one of the biggest problem that choosing wisely, that chosen wisely will have in Saudi is that there is a huge lack of trust between patients and physicians. For example, we measure patient satisfaction so physicians are incentivized to give the patient what they want, not what they need. This is in, in direct posi op opposition to choosing Wisely Canada, where the Canadian population generally trusts their physicians to make the best choice for them. 
In other words, there is no incentive for physicians to choose wisely. And on the other hand, Saudi patients do not trust physicians to make the right choice for them. What do you think, Dr. Aisha? Well, trust is one of the important cornerstone of, uh, when you are caring for the patient. Having a, a trustful system, this is one of the indicator, the quality indicator that need to be done. Uh, and uh, I, th uh, I think we cannot generalize this word that not all the Saudi people, they don't trust. I mean, for example, uh, as I'm working as a family physician, uh, what we see that commonly and uh, that we have a patient who's coming for opinion because they don't trust the private sector. They want to take uh, the opinion of the governmental sector. They feel that it's more trusted. Sometimes uh, there is, uh, it is uh, not, tr they are not trusting the primary care centers. They, they want the hospital because they think that the people are there. But it's not a general word. Uh, what what let people uh, feel that they don't trust the system because they didn't, uh, have enough time for conversation, explaining all the details, uh, so they feel that uh, they are engaged in the decision, uh, and they understand and they are informed about all uh, what is done for them. Uh, for having this conversation with the patient, in which it's explained, it let you uh, yeah, let you get the trust of the of the patient to some extent. Uh, for generalizing this word that it's uh, it definitely having the trust is a cornerstone, but generalizing it that not everyone is trusting the system is difficult. But we, what we want to have is uh, uh, a trustful relationship with our patients so they, they could believe in our system and having an education and a higher level and awareness will help to improve this. Uh, what is the other question, Dr. Zamiya? Uh, it, it's the same one, so uh, mm. there was more elaboration. So Vivian have uh, repeated her question. She's saying, is the use of order set can help in reduce unnecessary orders as the result of the research shared a while ago based mm -hmm. on physicians' feedback? Um, uh, will you agree that culture should be considered in choosing wisely campaign? I'm sorry, this is two different questions. So the first uh -huh. one was, um, explaining her first question, which is, is the use of order set can help in reducing unnecessary order? Eh, eh, sorry. Uh, who, uh, this, uh, this was experienced before in one of institutes here in Saudi Arabia, National Guard specifically. Uh, they removed from the, the word of routine test. They removed this from the system. So the physician need to request what he need individually, yeah, not a routine list that you tick and all the things will be requested. For um, avoiding this, having a list which is ready, it will help uh, in, in implementing, and this is a system issue. Uh, as it was seen by uh, uh, when uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Wendy earlier, she she gave five uh, circles about the, the main principle of choosing wisely, and one of them is the system. The system could support uh, by uh, by removing some of the things from the system, uh, so it will help to avoid the unnecessary test. Uh, for definitely having this done uh, could help, but it need to be uh, on evidence based level. Um, yes. The second Another question is about the culture. Yeah. Yeah, it's as the result of the research shared a while ago, based on physicians' feedback. Will you agree that culture should be considered in choosing wisely campaign? Definitely, 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 definitely. Uh, what we have uh, discovered that um, in, uh, usually uh, we feel a comfortable zone that the something which we use and practically we are using uh, make us feel safe. So change will make us feel unsafe. But this is a culture issue. Uh, for having that, I'm, for many years, I'm prescribing this, I'm doing it all the time, uh, changing my mood, how to switch to a new, uh, a, new, a new thing or behavioral culture. This is definitely one of the challenges, uh, and that's why uh, it, it takes time you need to change. You, know, you are changing the culture and a practice in a system was developed for many years.
Yes, so uh, there is uh, one comment from one of our own audience saying choosing wisely survey included also private hospital and how to be implemented for private hospital as will help for decrease polypharmacy and help to improve communication between physician and patient and healthcare provider as pharmacist uh, in addition management of prescribing medication in addition, how to be aware regarding new update in choosing wise. So this is um, elaborating more to the question that was raised earlier. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hanan. Um, so uh, we are um, um, about, we have 25 minutes left. I would like to take the chance, Dr. Aisha, uh, to share our Choosing Wise Saudi Arabia website, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure, and sure. then we would like to share um, uh, a video for all the winners uh, for choosing wisely uh, track in the um, uh, patient safety uh, award, uh, Saudi patient safety award. So I would like to take the chance and share my screen. So uh, this is Choosing Wisely website in Saudi Arabia. You can just write in Google Choosing Wisely Saudi Arabia and then you can see it. Uh, here we have some um, uh, recommendations for healthcare professionals in this uh, tab and you have some recommendations for patients or some educational materials for patients here or you can uh, click on these uh, boxes below and we shared some success stories, uh, studies that have been published um, in um, in some um, uh, uh, as as papers, and also we uh, soon enough uh, during uh, next week we are going to add uh, um, a full uh, guide on how to implement choosing wisely in your health institution, and um, uh, also uh, some uh, com uh, some. Um, uh, uh, paragraphs about uh, or details about um, how to adapt and how to use each recommendation. Um, and uh, now I would like to share um, one video uh, that show our uh, winners. Please tell me if you can uh, hear uh, the sound. نحن في مركز الأمير سطا لمعالجة أمراض وجراحة القلب القوات المسلحة وزارة الدفاع وضمن استراتيجية المركز ومبادرة الاختيار بحكمة قمنا بعمل مشروع تقليل الإجراءات المخبرية لفيتامين دال بما تلائم مع المعايير العالمية حيث تم حيث تم مراعاة لذلك سلامة المرضى بعدم تعريضهم للإجراءات المخبرية والطبية الغير ضرورية. حيث تم اتباع المعايير المتبعة في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والمملكة المتحدة وكندا وتطبيقها في المركز ورسالتنا للمستشفيات والمنشآت الصحية في المملكة السعودية هي نشر وتطبيق هذا المشروع لسلامة المرضى بدأ هذا المشروع في المركز الطبي الدولي بعد ملاحظة كثرة استعمال الأدوية المانعة للحموضة مدون مبرر وهي أدوية جيدة ولكن لها مضاعفات وعوارض جانبية والهدف من المشروع ترشيد استعمال الأدوية المانعة للحموضة في أجنحة التنين وبعد تثقيف الأطباء وبالتعاون مع الصيدلة الداخلية تابعنا أسباب صرف هذه الأدوية وعند وجود صرف بدون مبرر طبية تم الرجوع إلى الطبيب المعالج وتبين لنا انخفاض جذري وكبير بصرف هذه الأدوية بدون أي مبرر نوصي بترشيد استعمال أدوية الخافضة للحموضة مما ينعكس إجابا على سلامة المريض، صحة المجتمع وتخفيض تكلفة العلاج. Um, so uh, I just wanted to take the chance to show you this um, uh, successful stories that um, uh, that are one of many uh, um, uh, applicants uh, for choosing wisely in the track of choosing wisely in our uh, award and we would like to thank them and thank every applicant in this um, uh, reward. Uh, so Dr. Aisha. Yes, yes. Yes, we are uh, still receiving some questions. So uh, while we are displaying the Choosing Wisely website and also the um, uh, the, the the video, we uh, received uh, some uh, questions from our audience. Um, um, 
So there is a comment from Abdul Karim saying, by understanding the concept of choosing wisely concept, um, a patient physician relationship will improve and good uh, report will establish between them. It's a great initiative that will help the transformation in healthcare system as Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm trying to read some comments. If you have any reply to these comments, you can do so. Um, I'm just um, uh, trying to capture all uh, the comments and questions from our audience. So, um, Dr. Aisha, do you have any last messages for our audience and even the ones, because some of the audience are only healthcare providers and some of them are champions already actively in choosing wisely in their hospital and implementing their uh, hospital. So if you have message for this group and message for this group, please share it. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I think in having the champions with us here uh, to advocate for uh, this, uh, this national important initiative that could change the healthcare system and improve the concept of value care. Uh, so we do what is necessarily, we avoid what is unnecessarily. Uh, this needs a lot of patience. <laughs> uh, it needs also uh, to have uh, a clear, uh, uh, as, as also Prof. Wendy, we need to focus. We start with one and then we add another one with a clear sustainable plan uh, and we prioritize the thing. I advise everyone uh, to uh, to start from what others, uh, what others has been done. Uh, we have uh, sharing the experience in between the the, the champions in all uh, everywhere uh, to see what people has been done. This will be a starting point. Uh, also, uh, being familiar with the website uh, Lemia just uh, has raised, we have recently added the implementation guide in which we have the steps of implementing choosing wisely, uh, having an awareness program in the institute, and we are ready to help in this. Uh, if, if any time you, you think that you need awareness, you want our support uh, in having an awareness, uh, this will be uh, a step, a first step that could be done to engage more people uh, and more uh, practitioners uh, who are in the field and the leaders uh, to support the choosing wisely. Uh, we are ready to help and support in this. So uh, use our website as a reference. Uh, and a guidance, the guidance manual will help you to implement the step. Uh, start with one point and then uh, add another point, but we be, be clear in the prioritizing list and also have a sustainable plan, whatever project you start, it needs to be sustainable and it needs to be measured. Uh, so uh, it will be, it will clear the difference, so you will have support for the next one when it has been shown. Uh, the award is there, uh, Choosing Wisely Award uh, is here yearly. It will be uh, shared, what we share with you now, uh, is two uh, good stories you can use and implement and be the winner next time. Uh, and whenever you implement, you will be a winner. Uh, it's not only that you have to be awarded here, uh, and we are ready to support in the awareness and helping in the implementation. Of course, of course. And I would like to remind everyone that choosing wisely Saudi Arabia is not an effort of a small team or um, a group of people. It's the effort of a whole nation and the healthcare system. So I would like to take the chance to thank the champions who are implementing Choosing Wisely in their hospitals. And I would like to take uh, the chance to thank also the societies who are supporting us in uh, providing um, recommendations for healthcare providers and for patients. And everyone who, are, who is participating in this initiative, uh, a national in initiative, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aisha. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, I hope you uh, benefit from it. Uh, see you in our uh, next webinar. Uh, good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for the audience. And we wish that we see choosing wisely implemented everywhere. Thank you, Lamia. Thanks for the team and the patient uh, safety center. Thank you.